right everybody uh, this is the first of a series of videos in which I will introduce and demonstrate to you this little computer Cerberus 2100 which is a multiprocessor platform meant for education uh, it is not meant uh, to just play games uh, it's meant to show you from the individual gate from the individual flip-flop up how a computer can be put together and not any you know, standard simple microcomputer from the 80s but a multiprocessor one which has a Z80 processor here it has a 6502 or a W65CO2S a modern 6502 and it even has an AVR RISC controller here that plays the role of IO processor and uh, the core of the machine um, is a chipset of uh, three custom chips. These are these three CPLDs here, or complex programmable logical, uh, logic devices. This is FET Spacer, FET Cavia, and FET Skunk. The original version of this computer, Cerberus 2080, from two years ago, uh, the name of the chips in the chipset were uh, Spacer, Cavia, and Skunk. So now they are FET. <laughs> because uh, these are 100, 100 pin packages instead of 84 and they do more stuff than in the previous version. And another difference is that uh, Cerberus 2100 also has this expansion slot and some expansion logic here, which the original did not uh, have. So I will demonstrate this to you today. Uh, I think later on in the video, I will explain to you what are the educational features uh, of this machine. Right now, I just want to give you a brief uh, overview of the board. I already mentioned the key things, but let's go from the top to the right and then bottom systematically. Uh, this is a little buzzer. Uh, it produces the sounds. There is no other sound output. Uh, this is not a machine meant, again, for you to play game with nice chip tunes. This is an educational ma machine, so it, uh, a buzzer would do. This is VGA video. It produces a standard uh, VGA uh, signal. Uh, this is the one uh, um, through-hole electrolytic capacitor in the machine that's used for decoupling. It takes 5 volts from USB-C, so this is only power. This USB-C port is only for power, for nothing else. And the machine itself uses 5 volts everywhere except here for the micro SD card. Micro SD cards have built-in circuits that operate at 3.3 volts. So for the micro SD card, we have here a linear voltage regulator that takes the voltage from 5 to 3.3. And this is a little level shifter. It's actually a buffer chip that I am misusing as a level shifter, but it works, it works very well. It's <laughs> standard practice. <laughs> There's nothing abnormal in this. And then here we have a USB-A port. Um, which is for the keyboard, but the keyboard needs to be PS2 compatible. For instance, like this uh, uh, Maxite uh, keyboard, uh, it has a USB plug here, uh, but it's PS2 compatible. Um, Cerberus will only work with PS2 compatible keyboards. You can use a regular PS2 uh, keyboard with a six pin uh, DIN round connector, and you can buy a, I don't know, dollar and a half adapter from Amazon from PS2 to USB and you can connect it here. So uh, these are the main connections here on the side. There are two more. This, con this, con this connector here is for an FTDI adapter. And uh, an FTDI adapter is something like this. It basically has an FTDI chip, which you can connect here and then uh, USB, mini USB there, and you can use it to reprogram the firmware which presides in the flash memory of this Atmega 328PB. Uh, it has 32 kilobytes of flash, and that's where the BIOS, the kernel, the operating system of this machine resides. And because it's in the built-in flash, it doesn't use any address space. So all the 64 kilobytes of address space can be used for user programs and variables, uh, the BIOS does not take any address space. So that's the FTDI uh, adapter. And then uh, here, that's just a micro SD card port and the software that uh, we will be using uh, in this video 
um, is all here on this micro SD card. So these are the ports. This is the bus expansion. It's a 40 pin connector. It has the entire address bus, the entire data bus, and it has some specific control signals that allow this bus expansion um, to be DMA capable. DMA stands for direct memory access. So whatever you connect here can have access to all of the memories of the system. There are two 32 kilobyte SRAM chips in here. And these are two, two kilobyte double ported uh, RAM, um, also SRAM chips in here. So 64 addressable kilobytes in total, 32 here, 28 here, and then two plus two. All of these four memories can be accessed from the expansion slot. So the expansion slot doesn't need to be a passive circuit. It can be a microcontroller. It can even have an, yet another CPU. There are two CPUs and one processor here. You can add more in there. I actually have done it uh, during testing. And I think I showed that in a previous video where I was testing this expansion uh, port. I will link the video in the description. And now these uh, ports here, these are JTAG ports and they are meant to program the CPLDs. Um, if you buy a Cerberus 2100, it's not for sale yet. It will take a little while because the chips are hard to find right now. But if you buy one already ready to go, uh, uh, you will not need to use this port unless you want to reprogram and experiment with different um, hardware by reprogramming the CPLDs, which is one of the key points of this machine is to allow people to do just that. Now, to do that, you will need a little JTAG cable like this, which comes with a, a little port. This is the cable you need, by the way. I think it costs like 50 euros, something like this on Mauser. And if you want to program FAT Spacer, you just connect it here. And from your computer, you just send the new hardware configuration file to this CPLD. Uh, all in system, you don't, no, none of the chips uh, will come off. And you can do that for any of the three chips. You can do that for Fat Skunk here as well. So that, that's the point. It's to allow you to play with the hardware configuration itself. One of the points. Now the chips are, I already suggested them, these are, this is a buffer and three transceivers, and this is just to uh, provide uh, a drive and uh, tri-state mode for the expansion uh, port to keep it isolated from the computer without loading the buses. That's why we use these uh, three uh, uh, bus transceivers here and one buffer. All of them are tri-statable. Um, these little resistor banks here, they are just pull-ups for the address and data bus. They are 10 kilo ohm uh, pull-ups. Uh, let's start from this chip. This is FAT skunk and it's responsible for VGA timing. So it calculates uh, when we should be sending RGB information to the monitor, when we should be in a blanking interval and when we should issue uh, the sync pulses, the horizontal sync and the vertical sync. This chip, because it's the timing master of the video circuit, it provides the clock for this one. This one is Fat Cavia, and what it does, it scans all the time. It keep, keeps on scanning the video memory, finding out which characters are in each video memory position. And then on the basis of that information, it also scans the character memory, which is this other chip in here, where the character bitmaps are stored. And um, each character bitmap has eight bytes. At any one point in time, one of those eight bytes will be loaded here in Fat Skunk, where there is a shifter register and the bits are then shifted out via three RGB channels, which are buffered as well in here, and they uh, create the actual video signal. Now, as I already mentioned, this is the video memory and this is the character memory. So from this point up, it's the video circuit. And from this point down, it's the computer proper. And from the uh, pull-up uh, resistor uh, banks to the left, it's the expansion circuit. And to the right, it's the video circuit on top and the computer proper on the bottom. Now, what is the computer proper? It has the Z80, it has a 6502. It has a Atmega 328PB, which is the IO controller. It controls the keyboard. Uh, it controls the buzzer. 
uh, it also controls uh, the protocol for uh, the expansion. And these are the two system memories, normal single ported SRAMs. These two are dual ported because they need to be read from the top and read and written into from the bottom. And the glue logic to bring this all together is FAT Spacer, which is this chip. So the chipset is FAT Spacer, FAT Cavia, and FAT Skunk. All of them can be reprogrammed. So this, in a nutshell, um, is Cerberus. So let's go ahead and see this thing working. Let's turn it on and see this working. All right, let's turn this little thing on. It has a little starting jingle, and there we are. We are in the starting screen. Now, this screen is already the BIOS, the, the, the basic input-output system uh, of Cerberus. Uh, to load the basic interpreters, uh, the, instruction, the instructions are on the startup screen. You type basic Z80 for the Z8 basic, and basic 6502 for the other one. Um, but I wanted to, to give you a quick tour of the BIOS first. You can ask for help with a little interrogation mark and it gives you a list of the BIOS commands available and there are commands to move contents of memory, um, to load stuff into memory, to save stuff uh, from memory, um, but there is uh, no assembler in the BIOS. So you, you can theoretically program it, but then you have to program it uh, straight in machine code. So the BIOS, um, you could call it a monitor, it's a bit more than a monitor because it has a file system. It can reset the machine software-wise. If I type reset, the machine restarts, but it doesn't uh, destroy the contents of memory, which is a very important thing. You can also type help and you get the same uh, list of commands. Um, as you can see on the screen, the system is now targeted at the 6502 CPU at 8 megahertz. If this is running too quick, you can slow it down to 4 megahertz, or you can move to the other CPU by typing Z80, and then you are in the Z80. And if you want to go back to 8 megahertz, you type fast, and there you go, you are in the Z80 at uh, 8 megahertz. You can also list memory. If I just type list, it will start from address 0 but you can give any address, for instance, address 205. All addresses are in hexadecimal. Uh, if I list from 205 on, that's where the executable code is located. You see that uh, there is nothing there, 0 and 39. Th there is nothing there. It's just the random startup of, uh, of memory rows and columns. But if I load code, that code will go in there. Um, there are several other uh, BIOS commands. Let me see if there is anything else I want to show you. Most are just boring stuff, you know, you can, you can do a, a directory and list the contents of uh, the SD card. I have a loaded micro SD card, there's a lot of stuff in there. Uh, in the repository, um, there is a directory in the repository called the micro SD card files, and you can get all this stuff uh, uh, for yourself. So you can, you can have everything you're seeing me uh, use uh, in here. Uh, what else is there to show? Load and save, I'm not going to show, it's too trivial. I can test memory, uh, which is a more or less useless function since we know <laughs> it all works by now, but it shows you also um, uh, the characters in their default configuration. Character definitions can be changed on the fly, uh, but this is what uh, we have when we start up uh, servers. Um, it's a memory test because it's moving these characters around uh, uh, from, from the controller to low memory, from low memory to high memory, from high memory to video memory. So if, if you see these characters on the screen, you know that a lot of stuff um, is working. So this is it uh, for a BIOS tool. Uh, what we can do now is go to the 6502 basic and that's a command, you don't even need to use the command load file. You just type basic 6502 and it will automatically switch the CPU to the 6502 at 8 megahertz. It takes a little while to load, it doesn't mean that the machine uh, is stuck. It just takes a little while to load and we didn't have space uh, in the flash memory of uh, the I.O. controller to put little functions to make something blink or move. So you just have to be patient and wait. 
So this is uh, uh, Alexander Sharikin's um, uh, uh, basic interpreter for the 6502. Actually, it's a W65CO2S, a modern fully static uh, 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 6502 uh, CMOS version. Now, this basic you can use as a file system. If you type files, it's like a DIR in the BIOS. You see what is uh, on the micro SD card. So you have that functionality uh, here as well. Uh, and you can load stuff. Uh, we can load a little basic program like maze.prg. PRG is the extension for basic programs for the 6502. So if you load it and then we list it, it's a three line, <laughs> very simple program that draws a maze on the screen. It's very popular uh, in the C64. People like uh, to do this. But uh, here you see that uh, we are really executing basic code. Um, it, it, you, you can do other things, like there is a, a utility that uh, Alexander wrote called fonted.brg. Um, I think it's pretty short too. Yeah, it's three, less than three screens uh, of basic code. It's pretty short um, and it allows you to redefine characters. It's a character editor. So you can define um, your own uh, tiles, so to say. Uh, this first character that you're seeing, now I am in the second, um, you can see below the final character definition. So I am now in the second character, character on the top line, the second from uh, left to right. And um, I can mark it and you can see below that the character is indeed changing. Uh, I, I can construct my own stuff. I can unmark as well. And if you look below on the third character, you see that uh, it is changing. So this is just a character editor if you're programming your own games. Remember, this is uh, a educational uh, machine. It's not supposed to be a gaming machine. Uh, but what best application is there for education than for people to learn how to program uh, their own games? <laughs> Uh, what else have we got in there? Oh, I know what I want to do. Um, let's load, uh, let me see. Alexander, he wrote a game live on YouTube. There is a long video on YouTube of him uh, programming this game live, unedited. <laughs> and uh, it's pretty short. It's about two screens, two screens and a couple of lines. And uh, it's a very simple shooter but it illustrates so well what you can do. There is an airplane, you are this um, anti-aircraft truck on the bottom and you can fire at the airplane. It's like a simple version of Space Invaders. I am pretty bad at it. Ah, I'm gonna get killed. Yeah, I'm <laughs> um, it's, it's just an extremely uh, simple game, but it was written live. So it's, it's nice if you want to see how these things can be programmed. I want to shoot at least one down, so you <laughs> nothing spectacular happen, uh, happens when you shoot one down. You, yeah, uh, just another plane uh, comes in. Uh, let's see, there is another one. That, that, this one is more impactful. It's uh, slides h.prg. And this is to illustrate the tile graphics uh, capabilities of Cerberus 2100. You can fill the screen with characters and redefine them uh, on the fly to draw things in high resolution mode. Um, let's see how big, oh, this is actually written in, in assembly. So from basic, uh, we are just calling up uh, the source files. If we execute it, this is, this is a, a work of Alexander as well. So you see the high definition mode and then the character def definition changes for the next screen. And then you get that screen with the new character definition, then they are redefined again and you get the next screen and so on and so forth. So you can see how the characters are redefined um, on the fly uh, from within basic or assembly to allow you to draw um, high resolution uh, figures. I thought this is pretty cool. Um, so now all the characters are redefined because I just escaped in the middle of it. So it's, uh, you can't see anything, but what we can do, we press function F12. And then the characters 
the original characters are reloaded again and we go back to the BIOS. So fun F12 always brings you back to the BIOS. And from the BIOS, as I, as I you saw before, you can even reset the machine. So we have total control. Uh, we can go to the Z80 now. Let's see. Yeah, Z80, 8 megahertz. Um, oh no, before we do that, let's go back to the 6502 because we are not limited to, to the basic interpreter. We can write, we can load um, assembly or machine code programs, executables uh, directly from the BIOS. So this is again Sokoban ported by um, uh, Jeroen uh, Venema. Uh, for the 6502 in Cerberus, what have I done? Uh, let me see if I mistook the name. So code 65.bin. Yeah, yeah, it's loading. Takes a little while to load. And we can run it without any basic interpreter on the 6502. So this is a direct executable and it's the Soko Sokoban puzzle game. Uh, it, it, it's very addictive. Uh, we can try this level here. It looks very difficult. And the idea is you are this little man in the middle and you have to move these crates or these boxes to the marked locations on the floor. Uh, and it's much easier said than done. Um, I think uh, if, if I push any of these to the corner, I just lose access to them. <laughs> but uh, just to illustrate to you, uh, how the thing works. You just move these boxes around and if you manage to complete it, um, then you go to the next level. That, that's, that's basically the thing. <laughs> it's a fun game. Um, you, can, uh, you can quit it and start at any level you want. Um, level one, I think it should be the simplest, I guess. <laughs> Uh, oh, it's not very simple at all. You see, you have to bring those boxes all the way to the other side. Oh, no, I already screwed myself because now I can't move it up. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, yeah, I, I already screwed everything. I don't know how to play this thing. It is, it is difficult. Um, and pretty addictive too, so let's quit this. And if you quit it, you press uh, F12, and again, you go back to the BIOS. So now, let's go to the Z80. Whoa, no, there's one more thing I didn't show you. There are test applications uh, built in. There is the, the type uh, test application for the 6502, it's type6502.bin. Um, and these are very simple applications just to test. Uh, oops. Hello world. It's just a typewriter on the screen, but it's running on the 6502. And it tests the communication between the 6502 and the I.O. controller, which is written in the keyboards. So it is less innocent uh, than it seems. Uh, there is a more complex one, which is a cellular automaton, cell 6502. Uh, this one tests uh, the speed, uh, tests the ability of the CPU to write to memory, and it's going very fast, but this is what it's doing. Uh, it's doing a vertical scroll of a 1D uh, cellular automaton that draws uh, fractals on the screen, and each cycle it updates the definition of the one character that is used. And you can let it go. If it's too fast, uh, what you can also do... Uh, stop. F12. And you go back to the BIOS and you can type slow and then it will run at 4 megahertz. And now it's a little bit easier uh, to see. So this tests a bunch of things, memory access, also interface with uh, the I.O. controller because I can stop and step. So this is another one uh, of the test uh, programs. So now finally let's go to the Z80. The Z80 has the same test programs, for instance cell z80.bin because we want to, to test both CPUs. I mean I did when I was designing this. Now it's a little less important but it's good for you to test your own unit as well. The Z80 is a lot faster and the reason it's faster is that the Z80 has built-in logic to 
HALT and tri-state its buses. You just need to pull down one line and internally the Z80 knows uh, that it should, for instance, finish a memory uh, access cycle before it actually tri-states its buses. So it manages um, the state machine until it's halted. It manages it internally with internal logic. Um, the 6502 doesn't have that internal logic, so I have to manage it here um, in Fat Spacer. That's why the 6502 is much slower, because um, we are always um, halting and unhalting the CPUs when the two dual ported memories um, are serving on the same address, are serving, serving a read request from the video circuit. So the CPUs have to wait. So to wait, they have to halt. And the Z80 has this built-in logic to halt, goes very fast, but the 6502 has to be halted from the outside. Uh, and that's a little less convenient. So that's why this, the, the, the Z80 is so fast. Actually, it's faster than you are seeing because we are in slow mode. <laughs> If we go too fast and <laughs> run it again, then <laughs> it's dizzying. <laughs> you can't even see it, but we can step through it. All right, uh, stop, BIOS. If we now go and list address uh, 205, the beginning of the code area, now there is code in there, you see? Before there were just some crazy uh, numbers and you know, start row and column initialization pretty random now now there is code in there uh, okay let's go to basic z80 so this is the work of Dean Belfield uh, and this version of basic is BBC basic it takes a little while to load uh, the machine is not stuck <laughs> it is loading it so this is BBC basic it still says Cerberus 2080 because it was originally ported on the predecessor of Cerber Cerberus 2100 uh, but it's fully compatible, so it's not a problem. Uh, this also works as an operating system, so you can, for instance, uh, list the CPM-like operating system. You can list the contents of the micro uh, SD card. You can save and load and delete and all that good stuff that operating systems do. But uh, we are going to load some code. Um, let's load the high-resolution cube code extensions.bbc mean uh, BBC basic uh, programs. This was written by um, Leonard Benshop. Um, and it has not only the codes to render a rotating 3D cube, but the, the high resolution library that allows that cube to be drawn uh, on a pixel basis as opposed to on a character basis. That's why it's, uh, uh, it's so long and nice as well. So if we run it, we get a, a slowly rotating 3D cube. Um, remember, this is not supposed to be a machine in which you, you can run Elite, although you can. <laughs> uh, your frame rate will be pathetic, uh, but you can. This is supposed to be an educational machine. Um, if you want games, you know, you, you go to Argon Light. Uh, an Argon Console 8, which is made for games. And there are these uh, graphics that are being, uh, graphics capabilities that are being programmed for it. Uh, le let me show you a few of them <laughs> right now. Um, so you see what those graphics are in Argon Light, which is a much sim simpler, faster, cheaper machine than servers. Uh, but it's made to have fun, not only to educate. This is made to educate. So let's look at what Argon Light can do. This is the Amiga Bouncing Ball demo that uh, Lee Brown wrote for Argon in BASIC, which is pretty amazing. You're seeing this in BASIC as it runs in real time. And Curtis Wh uh, Whiteley did a number of things like transparencies with smooth motion, motion in motion, smooth at the pixel level, as you can see here. Um, th this one he just published in the week I'm doing this video. Uh, he did a bunch of other things, uh, uh, geometrical distortions with smooth motion. So, so Argon is great for these game-oriented things like lots of graphics, motion, colors. It's educative as well, uh, but Cerberus is more sober. It's focused also on hardware education, not only software. So it doesn't have these extra capabilities. So let's load something else. Let's load another program by Leonard. Uh, I think it's graph7.bbc. Uh, and this is just to illustrate his uh, high-resolution graphics library for Cerberus. 
it uh, draws a number of things on the screen. Start with a little license uh, text. You're free to copy, modify and use and so on and so forth. Copyright by Leonard C. Uh, Benchop. Uh, some explanation of the limitations of this thing and it draws long lines, it draws grids uh, and lines uh, within the grid. Um, so th this is a kind of a template to show people how they can do these things so they can write their own code and maybe even modify the hardware because the hardware of Cerberus 2100 is completely modifiable in system by reprogramming CPLDs. So this is drawing and erasing lines. This is all in the code. You can look up the code to see how he's doing all this. And you can borrow and steal, as he says, uh, to create um, your own programs. Uh, you can try, uh, draw uh, functions. So this is a dotted sign and then you have a continuous sign. Uh, this is sign with a second harmonic. So if you're familiar with the Fourier analysis, you understand what this is. This is a dampened sign, so this could be a 1D uh, oscillator, like something connected to a spring, and it would oscillate like this. These Azure figures, uh, these were very popular back in the 70s, and now people don't even remember what the Lisa Azure <laughs> figure is, but never mind. Uh, spiral. Again, the code to do all this is on the microSD card files directory uh, of the Cerberus 2100 uh, repository. Uh, and this is just drawing arbitrary things on a window on the screen uh, where you can draw anything at the pixel level because there are enough characters that you can redefine um, to do it. Um, let me list to you before I finish this video. I, let, let me go over the educational features of Cerberus 2100 so you understand what I mean when I emphasize that this is an educational platform not a machine just to have fun and play games. Uh, Argon is much better at that, much cheaper. Don't get a Cerberus to play games. Get a Cerberus for the following reasons. The first reason is that this architecture is clean. There are no shortcuts in here, no ugly things to, to, to save on costs. It's designed in a pretty didactical text uh, uh, book manner. The design is also very modular. As I hinted at before, there are three key uh, modules in the system. From the two dual ported memories up, we have the video circuit, which is made out of these two CPLDs. Uh, there is a 25.175 megahertz oscillator and some analog driving logic for the RGB signal. And uh, because this video circuit only talks to the north ports of the dual ported memories, it's completely asynchronous with everything else. It doesn't even need to run on the same clock. And in fact, it doesn't run on the same clock. It has its own oscillator here, while the computer proper has a 16 megahertz oscillator there. They are not in phase lock. They're, they're completely separate clock domains. Um, that means that if you start experimenting with the design of these two CPLDs, you need not to worry about what's happening underneath in the computer proper because there is no synchronization necessary between the two. And usually synchronization between the main computer and the video circuit is key because the video circuit cannot interfere with the memory accesses of the main computer and the other way around. It's like the BBC Micro that used half of the clock speed to give one cycle to the computer and one cycle to the video circuit. Well, here you have none of that. The dual ported memories ensure that you can play around with the video circuit without worrying at all about what's happening in the computer proper and the other way around. The same thing applies here for the expansion logic circuit. Although the CPU clock goes into one of the pins of the expansion, it doesn't need to be used. Whatever card you designed connecting here can have its own oscillator, its own crystal, because the communication protocol between the expansion slot and FATCAT, which is the IO controller, uh, uh, is completely asynchronous and modularized as well. So here you have one module, here you have another module, and here you have yet another module. So three 
asynchronous independent modules, so you can experiment with either one of them without worrying about the other. There is no phase relationship that needs to be enforced uh, uh, across these domains. They are separate clock domains, completely separate. Now, as I alluded to before, um, what makes Cerberus Cerberus in large part are these three CPLDs, the chipset. And because they are CPLDs, they are entirely programmable. You can connect a JTAG cable to any one of these ports and completely change in system uh, what the circuits uh, do. Um, but there is more. CPLDs have a very stable timing model. Whatever Boolean logic you program in a CPLD, the propagation delay will be exactly the same. You are not going to change the timing if you change the Boolean logic. You will only change the timing if you start adding a register-based logic, like if you, you, you add a register in a pipelined architecture, yes, okay, now if you start pipelining, you will change the timing, but uh, it's not necessary. And, uh, and actually, it's not even desirable. I, I, I'm not sure it would even work. Uh, what people would do is change the logic, the Boolean logic, the logic equations, the product terms, the ends and ors and inversions and all that stuff. And you can change all of that to your heart's content and the timing will not change. So that's a fantastic feature because if you were doing this in an FPGA, for instance, the moment you change something in an FPGA circuit and you resynthesize and you place and route it again, you have to close the timing. You, you, you have to make sure the timing stays the same, which is not trivial. Timing closure is where chip design teams spend the most time, the most effort before a tape out, if you're doing a custom chip. But the same rationale applies here. With an FPGA, you would have to make sure that timing closure is properly, properly, done, properly done and that you didn't screw up all the timings when you reprogram the logic. Here, with three CPLDs, you don't need to worry about that. You don't need to worry about configuration memory either because uh, uh, the flash configuration memory is already inside the chips. They don't need to be outside, somewhere else on the board. And you turn this thing on, the CPLDs are instantly configured. They are already configured when the computer is off. They don't need to upload a, a net list or a configuration bitstream from off the chip, none of that stuff. So that's another reason why this is so didactical. Yet another is that um, unlike in Agon, where I used, for instance, uh, an ESP32 uh, uh, system in a package, a fairly complex system, you know, with three different processors, an onboard oscillator, all kinds of analog uh, components inside, everything hidden under an epoxy package. So it's a black box. It does something, uh, but you, you don't know what it's actually doing. You have the data sheet, but you, you, you don't have the netlist. You don't know the gates. You don't know how it does what it does. Here in this system, that's not the case. Uh, CPLDs are programmed at the level of individual gates and individual flip-flops. And you can see them all um, in the .pld file that configures or determines uh, uh, the functionality of the CPLDs. Uh, I will be discussing those files with you in a later episode. I, I will show you how easy it is to read those files. It's much easier than to look at the schematics. In schematics, you have to follow the lines, you know, and you get that noodle soup logic. With a PLD file, it's all, you know, there's this Dutch word, overzichtelijk. Um, it means uh, amenable to overview. And a .pld file is very amenable to a review. You, you land your eyes on a .pld file and you know what's going on. It's not like a schematics that you need to follow the lines and reconstruct everything in your head. That's not the case. So these are very accessible for understanding what the computer does. These are white boxes, transparent boxes. You can see every single gate, every single flip-flop. Uh, the same applies here. These are just buffers and transceivers. Uh, the same applies, of course, for the memories, which are very simple devices. There are the, on the only black boxes in this system are the two CPUs and the I.O. controller. And you might say, well, these are the most important parts. That's why I have another project called Talos, in which I am designing a um, RISC uh, CPU capable of four different parallel operations every cycle. I have a separate uh, video series on this channel talking about that. The project is not yet complete, but uh, I will be addressing that in, in that project. 
Here in the Cerberus project, I take the CPUs or the three processors to be black boxes, but I open up the boxes for everything else. So you can see what computer architecture actually is in all its glorious details down to individual gates. Um, so that's, that's the educational purpose of this, to show how you put together a computer and not a simple computer, one with three processors, expansion capabilities and all that stuff. Now you may ask, well, Bernardo, you have very nice CPLDs, they are programmable, there are three of them, but if what you want is hardware programmability, why don't you make a board with one big FPGA <laughs> in the center? Because then everything is programmable. Yeah, but that wouldn't be very didactical and educational, would it? Because then you just have logic blocks and, and an interconnect network, and you have to start from scratch. You have to start your computer from scratch. Or if you get already something designed in VHDL, uh, you have to understand that. And if you modify it, you have to resynthesize and do timing closure again. No, that, uh, that's um, for most uh, undergraduate students of computer engineering or electronics engineering, uh, and most hobbyists, I dare to say, um, that's one step uh, too far. So what I try to do here is to give you a starting point, a complete starting point that works. This is a fully functional computer, as you've seen today. So you don't need to worry about all the basic housekeeping, all the foundations, you know, before you can see something on the screen, you, you, were, you, you will already, already have spent weeks, if not months on it. It doesn't give you quick feedback about the changes you make. It's not a very nice learning experience, but this way you turn it on, it works. You make modifications on any of these three chips within seconds, you look at the screen and you see what happened and you don't need to worry about the foundations and all the house housekeeping to get the thing to work for the first time. It's already all done there. It's already all there for you. The system is already partitioned into three asynchronous modules. Everything comes already working. You have a solid starting point. It's much more fun to learn this way. And one of the frustrations I had when I was an undergraduate, I went to computer engineering school, I was 17. Um, one of the frustrations I had was how long it took for my teachers to show me a complete computer for the first time. It was maddening. I went to engineering school to figure out how a computer is put together. And they put me through all kinds of things, you know, digital signal processing, uh, control applications, a lot of math, uh, a lot of stuff, and then Boolean logic, you know, that's, that's easier. But a lot of stuff, a lot of different parts of it. And then we looked into state machines and then processor design, and then we looked into memory design. It was years, I think only in the fifth year, uh, for the first time we were shown, okay, how, how can this whole thing come together? So that, that was one of my frustrations 32 years ago, almost <laughs> now. Um, so I wanted now to give something back uh, to the community of electronics and computer engineering that fulfilled my, that, that, that dealt with my old grievance uh, back in school. This is how a whole computer comes together. It may not be the best. It's certainly not the most efficient. It's it's made to be didactical, not uh, not super efficient, but it's efficient enough. It is realistic enough. It's representative enough. And if you look at the CPLD files of these three chips, which take like two A4 pages, including all the commentary, uh, which you can read very quickly, you immediately see how the whole thing is brought together. And that's your starting point, something that is already working. So I think that is the key um, educational value of this uh, next to all the other things I mentioned. All right, we are back. I hope you've enjoyed uh, this little uh, demonstration of the basic uh, capabilities of Cerberus. I will be publishing a series of videos uh, over the coming weeks, um, focusing on particular parts um, of Cerberus going into the three custom chips that make up the Cerberus 2100 chipset. 
going through the design, the CP CPLD hardware uh, uh, specification of the three. So you see how easy it is to understand it, how easy it is to modify it. And you can never go wrong because the machine already sets the basics ready for you. Um, so if you make a mistake and the machine stops working, you can just reload the original CPLD configuration and you're back in business. Uh, and you don't need to you know, start from scratch like in an FPGA, where you would need to design every little aspect of the computer from scratch. Here you get a computer that is already working and it's modular and compartmentalized, so you can have fun with the different parts of it um, uh, while already starting from something that works and has all the housekeeping, all the, you know, the difficult and, and boring stuff already built in, already working, uh, and whatever you change, you can immediately see the result on the screen as opposed to coding an FPGA for weeks before you even get a valid uh, VGA signal. So that's the spirit. I will be uh, saying a lot more about this in the coming weeks, so stay tuned for that. In the meantime, thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.